Well, good morning. Ah, oh, come on, come on. Good morning. It is Valentine's weekend, I guess. It's like, it's not even, I guess it's like Monday. I'm not sure. I guess it falls on the, some of you are like, no, it falls next week because I didn't plan anything. So um, anyway, tomorrow is Valentine's Day, but today is Super Bowl Sunday. Anybody? Some of you? Yes? No? All right. Go Steelers. Wait. They're not in it. Um, but uh, aside from all of that stuff, even more importantly, we're starting a new series this morning. So um, we're starting a new series uh, in the Gospel of John that we're calling Share Life Like Jesus. And so one of the healthy characteristics of being a true disciple of Jesus is that you share the good news about Jesus with others, right? Like, it's how God has called us to make disciples and fulfill his great commission. Christianity's never really been about sitting around waiting for him to come back and kind of burying our talents in the ground while the world stumbles around in darkness. That's not what Christianity is about. It's always been about sharing the life that we have, the life and light in Jesus with other people. Um, and so making disciples who make disciples is the great commission that Jesus gave us all, and, and it happens by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, right? But this can be a little intimidating. Maybe it's just me. Now, some of you are like, wait a minute, the pastor gets intimidating in sharing the gospel? Sometimes, yes, for sure. And yet, like, it, you know, it makes sense. Like, this is the world we live in, right? Like, even bringing up the name of Jesus in conversation almost always brings a huge shift in the atmosphere. You ever notice that? Like, even, even believers hear somebody else bring up Jesus, and it's like, oh, here we go. You know why? There's power in the name of Jesus. Right? It kind of puts people on edge a little bit. It's like, well, what's it going to say? What's about to happen? Which is honestly just more reason to bring him up in as many conversations as possible, right? Like, I mean, naturally, supernaturally, bringing him into everything. Or I would say acknowledging him in everything because he's already in it. Amen? Just recognizing that reality. But sometimes that's easier said than done. Like, have you ever heard people talking about a conversation or like an interaction that they're having with a friend or a coworker or a family member or somebody, and then... You know, or like the random guy at the cash register who suddenly like that you're having, you know, it's like I'm walking through the grocery store and, you know, suddenly I met this guy and I found myself praying with him to receive Jesus. It's like, how'd you get there? Right? You hear these interactions, these stories, and suddenly these people are catapulted into these gospel-centered conversations about Jesus and you kind of catch the tail end of it. But the question that kind of always comes up inevitably is, how did you get there? Like, how did that even start? Was there some kind of, like, opening line that you used? Like a, like a, like a Jesus pickup line for people? Like, is there, is there something that, like, I'm missing? Or some magic tactic or sly statement that just sends you into those conversations about Jesus and his kingdom? So I've actually been looking forward to this series for a long time now because what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep dive into the way Jesus naturally shares life with people about the kingdom of God. Just naturally supernatural, because that's who he is. It just overflows out of him. So we're going to look at the way that he interacts with others. We're going to look at everything from his body language to his words. And I want to drink in the master disciple maker, because that's who he is, right? And I want to look at what motivates him and how he shares the good news of the kingdom. And I want to see that it all flows directly out of his relationship and his love and his heart for God and God's heart for people. And honestly, it's that simple. And yet, extremely profound, right? So my hope for the series is that as we drink in the master disciple maker, He's going to give us a heart for others. He's going to give us his eyes to see, his words to speak, his feet to go, and even his arms to embrace the world around us. And it doesn't matter what your personality is. This is not about who is the, the, the gifted extrovert, right? Who's the, those are the evangelists. 
right? It's not about people who are even specifically anointed or gifted as being an evangelist because we're all called to do the work of an evangelist, every one of us. So my hope is that we will tap into the very spirit of God and become the very body of Christ to the world around us simply by falling deeper in love and beholding him and then sharing the life that we have in him. This is not like a go and be better and do more kind of thing. It's a behold Jesus kind of thing. And everything else will be added unto you. And I mean everything, right? So now I know that often I tend to share stories of interactions that I found myself in also, right? And, and I want you to know that I often totally blow it. Like, <laughs> Like, I'm like, really intentionally feel like God's called me to share the gospel with somebody, and I'm just stumbling, tripping, and like, mess that up completely, right? You often get the stories from me that were successful. It's like Instagram, you know, I'm just giving you all the goods. But honestly, when I think back on those kinds of interactions, it's much more like he's seeing people and loving people through me, and sometimes even in spite of me. Seriously, like there, there's been countless situations where my heart goes out to somebody or he places somebody in front of me in the most random places and I'm like, really God, right now? And he's like, yep, now, them, you're in the vitamin shop, that guy's about to receive Christ, go. That happened, I'm not kidding. I honestly couldn't tell you how, don't know. But there's, there's been countless situations like this. And as we're going to see in this series, Jesus is pleased to be inconvenienced along the way. Right? I don't think it's a template. There's like a template to be copied and pasted or even like a special one-size-fits-all tactic. O- oftentimes that can get real mechanical and spiritless and loveless. Right? However, you know, there are things that we can become more aware of and, and wisdom to learn and use when engaging, embracing, and embracing others. But at the end of the day, sharing life like Christ happens as the natural overflow of sharing life in Christ, okay? Tapping into his heart, beholding his glory, and letting him fill you with his spirit to see and engage and embrace the world around you. Because when you share life in Christ... You'll share life like Christ. Again, hear me. I blow it all the time, but every now and then I'm blown away by what God invites me to participate with him in. Many of you have been a part of that, seen that. We do this together. It's beautiful. So in this series, we're going to walk through the Gospel of John, starting with chapter 1. And I want to take a look at specific encounters and interactions that Jesus has with people. I want to look at how Jesus shares life with people and dialogues with them. I want to look at how he personally adapts his message to meet people right where they are in grace and in truth and in deep compassion, yet without compromise. Like, how does he do that? Well, we're going to behold it. We're going to behold the way Jesus shares life in the kingdom. And my hope is that we would then become conduit for Jesus by the Holy Spirit to share that same life with each other and our city and beyond today. Okay? So last week I said that to share life like Christ, we must be sharing life in Christ. That was the heartbeat of Christ's prayer in John 17. And it's the heartbeat of this entire series as we walk through the book of John And we're going to look at these interactions. So as we kick off the sermon series, though, here's what I want you to get, okay? If you get nothing else, it's honestly, this is what I want you to get. It's really the same point that we had last week. And it's going to saturate the rest of this series, all right? When you share life in Christ, you'll share life like Christ. I want you to really understand the power of this because this is everything. This is what we're invited into and what we're commissioned to go and do, right? So turn with me to John 1, and let's start with a a, a revelation of who Jesus actually is. And then we're going to hone in on the first interaction Jesus has with his first two disciples, John and Andrew, in verse 35 through 39. So look with me uh, at John 1. 
And this is how the gospel of John, the guy who's writing this is named John, the son of Zebedee, uh, who was one of his disciples. He's giving the account, um, and this is what he says. This is how he opens. John 1, verse 1. You with me? All right, here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All right, so, so John, he comes out swinging here with the glory of God in Jesus Christ. I mean, this is just one of those things where it's like if you read this and you've got any clue of what's happening here, this is one of those like, wake up, think about who I'm talking about here, right? Like in order for any of his interactions to matter, we've got to realize who it is that we're beholding here in Jesus. He's not just some moral teacher offering suggestions on how to live your best life. He is life. Look, like apart from him, we've got only death. Think about that. We've got to get that. That's what he's articulating here. So John 1 is actually a direct reference to the first chapter and the first verse of Genesis, which is the creation account. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? And so John begins this gospel account saying, in the beginning was the word. So he's referring to Jesus as the word of God, the very communication of God the Father, overflowing in infinite goodness and glory and fullness. He's the very essence of logic and rationality itself, and yet fully personal and fully relational. That's wild! Like, he's not an ethereal or insubstantial idea. He's relational. He's personal. He was God. And... He was with God. So he's indistinguishable from God and yet somehow distinct. So this is part of the mystery of the Trinity. Like this should make you think. Like think. Use that brain that God gave you. That's a good thing. God's calling his people here in these types of mind-blowing presentations. He's calling his people to contemplate and to meditate and to ponder and to engage the synapses of your brain to think logically and rationally. Not to shut down and check out and be like, well, I can't comprehend that, so what's the point? But to engage in the glory of who he is and what he has revealed. It's part of worship. And yet also to realize This is all fully logical. And it's logical for us not to be able to fully comprehend him because he's God and we're not. That's actually logical. It should blow your mind. If it doesn't, you're wrong, right? Like this is supposed to make you wonder because he is wonderful, right? So the Greek word for word here, when it talks about in the beginning was the word, it's talking about Jesus as the word, he's, it's actually the word in Greek, logos. It's where the very word logic comes from. Christianity is actually supremely logical, just not necessarily by a fallen world standards of what logic is. The truth is this fallen dark world is extremely illogical. The only true logic comes in following Jesus. We're going to talk about this. So we see both in Genesis 1 and here in John 1 that all of creation finds its origin in the very word of God as it was spoken into existence. Genesis 1-3 says, and God said, say said, let there be light, and there was light. John 1, 4 through 5 says this. So back to John 1. It says this, in him, talking about Jesus, talking about the word, talking about the logos, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So you see the reference here, right? Back to Genesis. It could also be translated as the darkness has not comprehended it. Okay? He is the origin and fullness of true light and life, both physically and spiritually. He is the word of God eternally throbbing with the fullness of life and light, and it utterly eradicates and even confounds the forces of death and darkness. That's who he is. 
Like not only can they not overcome him, but they're completely overwhelmed and even confounded and confused by him. Like this is the Jesus that we serve. This is our Savior and King. You ever wondered why demonic forces in the Bible, when he encounters them, they're so terrified and they're also confused by his presence. You'll see that if you, when you're reading through, I want you to notice that. Because not only has it not overcome, the darkness can't overcome him, it's also confounded by him. Okay? And so although they may kill him, he will rise because in him is life. And the life is the light of men. You're going to have to think this morning. Right? Think about this. This is the gospel. God became a man. He lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserve to die. And he conquered death in the grave. And he paved the way to eternal life. An eternal life that starts now, not just one day when we die, but it starts now through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit who enters into our midst and recreates us and remakes us into the children of God and the children of light who become the light of the world. Like, I want you to see this because I want you to see who it is that we're reading about here. Like, this is the one who spoke you into existence. Like, this is the very record of the risen Lord, the word of God, the catalyst of creation. As one commentator put it, darkness can no more overcome the light than creation could overcome its creator. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. I want you to really get this. Again, Jesus isn't just some made-up storybook character or cartoon fairy tale. Like, he's not just some kind of teacher offering ideas of recommendations for society, right? He is life and light. To ignore, trivialize, or disobey him is death and darkness. But to receive him and to follow him and to worship him is abundant life, full of grace and truth. Like the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Like that word there for dwelt is a word that means he tabernacled among us. It's a reference to the way God's presence dwelled in what was called the tabernacle in his, uh, of his people, even in the wilderness in the Old Testament, where his presence dwelled among them and all of their tents surrounded the tabernacle where his manifest presence, his holy of holies, moved with them. When, they, when he moved, they moved. That's how it went. And that was all a foretaste of what God would ultimately do as he tabernacles with us in Jesus Christ and through his spirit now. So the word of God, the communication of God, the catalyst of creation in the flesh, tabernacling in our midst. That's what he's talking about. Some of you are like, what? Sit tight and open wide. This is another one of those fire hydrant series, okay? John 1, verse 16 through 18. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It's a reference back to Exodus, right? He talks about Moses. Now, this doesn't mean that, that, that the law wasn't a good or even gracious thing. Like, no other nation was given favor like Israel was. They were the ones that God gave his law to. That's an amazing gift of grace to even have the word of God, the law of God given to him. The point that he's making here in verse 17 is that the revelation of Christ is even better than what God gave to Moses through the law. All right? In fact, Jesus is the fullness and the fulfillment of the law. Like, you might even say he's the word of God in the flesh or something, right? Like, look at verse 18 again. Like, no one, or verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now, I want you to get this again. Really grasp the power of this. And so in order to do that, I want you to see the connection that John's making here 
in John 1 with Exodus 33 in the Old Testament. Like, look real quick with me. Exodus 33, verse 18. This is how Moses received God's law that was just mentioned. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. All right? Follow this. Lean in here. So verse 18 says this. Moses, so he's speaking to God. Moses is speaking to God, and he says, Please show me your glory. And he said, God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. There's a reason this chokes me up and I'm about to explain it. This is how God reveals himself to Moses in the Old Testament. Thousands of years before Jesus comes to earth, right? There's, there's so much here that's just screaming Jesus. So bear with me because this is, is going to be a ton of imagery and so much goodness here. All right? So if you catch half of this, I'm going to be happy. So Moses asks to see God's glory, right? And God says all of his goodness will pass before him and proclaim his name. So that which communicates the very essence of who God is, his character, his nature, his ways, all of his goodness. That's what the name means, right? And so, so it will pass before him. That's important. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pass by him, pass before him. Remember that. But in verse 20, he says that you can't see my face because it would be fatal. Moses is a sinful man. And sinful humanity can't handle the unmitigated glory of God, which is what it means to see his face, okay? But God says in verse 21, there's a place by me. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's at his right hand. You know, the place where Jesus is seated, according to Hebrews 10 and Revelation 5. It's also the place where the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore are, according to Psalm 1611. Also, this is the place, this place by God is where Moses shall stand on the rock. And I don't think he's just talking about a, a physical place on top of a mountain. I think he's speaking to something way deeper. Like throughout the Bible, Christ is alluded to using the imagery of a rock or a stone. He's the rock of our salvation. He's the cornerstone. He's the firm foundation upon which we stand. The imagery is used in parables like Matthew 7, where the wise man built his house upon the rock instead of the shifting sands, right? Or, or like the stone of David, which takes down the giant Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, which is a picture of what the Messiah would do to the enemies of God. Or, or like Daniel's dream of a stone that's cut out from a mountain by no human hands. And it's hurled at ungodly kingdoms, crushing them. And then that stone grows into a huge mountain that represents the kingdom of God and fills the entire earth. That stone is a reference to the Messiah or the Christ and his kingdom that would grow and expand and fill the earth. And that's definitely the case here in Exodus 33. Like he says to Moses, this place in my presence will be the place where you shall stand on the rock. And it says that his glory will pass by him. But the only way that he's going to survive the glory is not only by standing upon the rock, but by being literally hidden in the rock. Whoo! Look at it, verse 22. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. 
No, it's important to remember that God intends for his glory and presence and all his goodness to pass him by. Again, remember that. In the next few verses, God tells Moses to cut out two tablets of stone. Again, the reference to Jesus, the rock of our salvation, is all over this, right? Because God says, I'm going to write his very words in the form of the law on stone. So God's going to manifest the word of God upon the rock. The imagery, it's just, it's like astounding here. It's just unavoidable and it's magnificent. I want you to see this. This is how God revealed himself to Moses in Exodus uh, 33 and how he gave him the law, which was his word. All right? If you're not taking all this in, it's okay. Go back, meditate on it, ponder it, pray through it. It's powerful. But listen here in in, in Exodus 34, verse 8. Listen to Moses' final prayer before he takes the law that was given to him, these words that were given to him to his people. This is his prayer. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward earth, and he worshipped. And he said, If now I found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people. So stiff-necked people have a hard time repenting and turning their gaze towards the Lord and away from their sin, right? They're like, oh, no, I'm, that sin's great. I don't want to turn. That's what a stiff-necked people are, unrepentant. You cannot follow Jesus if you are unrepentant. If you want your sin more than you want your Savior, you can't follow him. doesn't mean you don't struggle, but you got to say, God, I don't want that. I want you, right? This is the power of it. Moses knows this, and so he's interceding to, with God on behalf of these people. And he says, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. So this was Moses' prayer after having stood upon and hidden in the rock of salvation as the glory of God passed him by. His prayer was for the Lord himself to go into the midst of us. To recognize that we're a sinful people, and no matter how much we try and look away from sin, we always tend to kind of like look back to it. But we've got to continue to keep just beholding him and hiding ourselves in him. So this is his prayer, to go in the midst of us. It was a prayer for repentance and salvation and redemption of God's people. And that's exactly what has been answered in Jesus Christ, the ultimate rock of our salvation. All of this is what John 1 is trying to communicate to us about who Jesus is. The word of God, the creator of the universe, life itself, who is the light of men. The word made flesh, dwelling in our midst, tabernacling among us, even within us, full of grace and truth. Grace upon grace and abiding. That's who we're talking about. That's, this is, we're talking about Jesus. John 12, 45, in John 12, 45, Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So, also, when it talks about Jesus being at the right hand of the Father or at the Father's side, it re- really actually means that he's in the bosom of the Father. Like, right in the heart of the Father. That's what he's talking about. It's an expression of deep intimacy. All right? And it's that intimacy that he's inviting us into. So it means when it talks about being at his side. It's literally in his bosom. In fact, this is the exact language that John, the author of this gospel, uses to describe the way he relates to Jesus. <laughs> he refers to himself as the beloved disciple. And in John 13, 23, he describes himself being at Jesus' side or literally in the bosom of Jesus. You might even say hidden in the cleft of Jesus. By the way, you want a Valentine's Day message? You ever wondered why God created Eve from Adam's rib in Genesis? Oh, well. She's a picture of Christ's church, the bride of Christ, who is ultimately created to be intimately at his side or in the bosom of the Lord, which is the picture. Covenant marriage is designed to reflect the love between Christ and the church. How awesome is this? So the kind of relationship Jesus had with the Father is the kind of relationship John had with Jesus. And John is inviting all of us through his recorded account in this gospel to experience the same kind of relationship he has with Jesus in the Father. So it's the invitation to be his beloved, redeemed disciple. 
experiencing grace upon grace and truth, true love, compassion without compromise, and the fullness of God's glory in Jesus who tabernacles with and within us as the word made flesh. If that overwhelms you with wonder, good. It should because it's wonderful. In many ways, that's why John's recording the account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus here. It's not just so you can be saved from hell. It's so you can share life in Christ. And when we share life in Christ, we'll then share life like Christ. It all starts with all of this. Right? So now that we, this is why I want you to give a, get a glimpse of who it is that we're talking about and the relationship we have here. And, and now, now. We've got that. Let's now hone in on these next few verses as the incarnate king interacts with his first two disciples, Andrew and John, the son of Zebedee, who's also the one writing this gospel account. Look with me at John 1, verse 35. It says this, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. So this is talking about John the Baptist, all right? That's what he's talking about here when it says John. It's a reference to John the Baptist, who's actually different than the John who wrote this gospel. Different from John the son of Zebedee. Like John the Baptist is the one who was calling people to repent and preparing the way for Jesus. And then he points to Jesus and says, behold the Lamb of God. And it's a powerful statement about who Jesus is, right? But the two men who were with John the Baptist are like, okay, he's the one we've been waiting for? Got it. So they leave John the Baptist in order to follow Jesus, which is exactly what John the Baptist wants, right? So here's what, where it gets really good, Okay. I want to take a look at the first recorded interactions between Jesus and these first two disciples. There's so much in here, but this morning we're just going to hone in on Christ's first interaction with his first two disciples, who are Andrew and John, the son of Zebedee, again, the one writing this account. So again, remember, there's John the Baptist, and then John, the son of Zebedee. Don't get those two confused. A lot of people get them very confused, which makes sense here. Um, But again, I, I want to be clear because that can get confusing. So look with me at John 1, verse 38 through 39, all right? So John the Baptist is standing there with John, the son of Zebedee, and Andrew. Got it? That's what we just read. And they look, and he's like, they see Jesus, and he's like, Lamb of God, and they're like, got it, bye. Right? That's what's going on here. Verse 38, Jesus turned And saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. There's so much here. Just in these two verses, there's so much about the way Jesus interacts with us and how he wants to interact with others through us. All right? So you guys with me here? Hone in on this because this is like, this is really good. So there's three significant things that Jesus does here that are crucial for sharing life in Christ and sharing life like Christ. The first thing he does is probably the thing that's most overlooked, right? And yet it's probably the most significant thing he does in all of redemptive history. This could be a whole series in and of itself. I can't emphasize the importance of this first action enough because it's everything. The first thing he does is turn. Jesus turns and sees. It's the first thing he does. Like it may seem like it's an insignificant detail, but it's not at all. And it's probably the very detail most people leave out when attempting to share life in Christ. They don't even see the people they're talking to. They don't see them. They're still focused on their own agendas or their ideas. They see projects. They don't see people. Jesus sees people. This is right to the heart of them. Like, let's let's drop back here. And I want you to get a visual again for what's happening. John the Baptist has been preaching and baptizing people. And he's preparing the way for Jesus to come. 
and he's gathered a number, of, a, a number of disciples for himself, and yet his entire ministry wasn't really about drawing anyone to himself. It was about preparing them all to follow Jesus. So Jesus shows up, and, and it's the Messiah. It's the Son of God. He's here. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And the day before this, John the Baptist realizes that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. Right? And, and he encounters Jesus, and he, and he heard God the Father speak over his son, and the Baptist even saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus like a dove and stay with him. That all happened the day before this. And so now it's the next day, and all the commotions died down, and you can be sure that John the Baptist has been telling his disciples about what happened the day before. That might be even the conversation he's having with John and Andrew right there when we see them. And so John's standing here with John, son of Zebedee, and Andrew, and he sees Jesus walking by. Notice Jesus isn't walking away from them. He's not walking towards them. He's passing by them. There's this window of time where the Son of God has come near, but it's also clear that he intends to walk by to go on his way, to be about his business, you might even say, again, to pass them by. Sound familiar? Remember, we've just been reminded of the situation in Exodus where the glory of God and all his goodness, all of his goodness, passes by Moses. Moses couldn't handle the face of God. He could only catch a glimpse of his back. But here, the glory of God and all his goodness, the fullness of the Father is passing by again. And John the Baptist's testimony comes to complete fruition here. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, the implication here is that not only is Jesus the fullness of, God, fullness of God's glory and goodness, not only is Jesus the very image of the invisible God, not only is he the visible face of the Lord himself, he's also the lamb who takes away our sin. He's also the rock of our salvation and the foundation upon which we stand and the very cleft in which we hide in the very presence of the unmitigated glory of the Father. What? That's a lot. I know I'm using a lot of words because I don't quite know how to communicate this. Like he is the approachable avenue through whom we may encounter the God who dwells in unapproachable light. And through the testimony of John the Baptist, his disciples begin to follow Jesus. And when they do, Jesus, God in the flesh, who's passing by, turned and saw them. Like, you can't overlook this. God turned towards them. God turned towards them, and his face shined upon them. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's a popular blessing from the Old Testament in the book of Numbers 6. Verse 24 through 26, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You know why that's popular? Because it's the cry of every human heart. Can you see this? It's happening right there. Like the hairs on my arms stand up just thinking about this. Like the eyes of the Lord turned towards them. The Prince of Peace and the Lion of Judah fixed his gaze upon Andrew and John as they drew near. Like it would have been both peaceful and petrifying. Because Jesus doesn't just see them, he sees all of them. He sees right through to the very beginning of them. His eyes are like a consuming fire. He is the creator king. Again, he's not just some happy moral teacher. He's the glory of God incarnate. And he doesn't need the disciples. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need any of us. He's fully good and fully glorified and perfectly content in himself. And he has been for eternity. And yet, and yet, and yet, Jesus turned Like the Son of God is pleased to inconvenience himself and turn towards you. 
And just to show you that I'm not just reading into a trivial detail here, this actually is a theme that saturates the entire Bible. The image began in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, they sinned against God, and they found themselves ashamed, exposed, and vulnerable. So they try to cover themselves with fig leaves, and they try to hide. Then Genesis 3, verse 8 through 10 says this, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? The image here is of God turning to look for Adam. God, he knows where he's at. God's not really confused here. But the image that's given is that God isn't just going about his business as if Adam doesn't matter. Like he wants him to be with him. Right? And so the implication of God's question here, where are you, goes way deeper than a mere location. God's calling Adam to identify the condition of his own soul. How many people in our world are just ignoring the condition of their own soul? Where are you in life right now? Take inventory of yourself. Investigate your own heart and your relationship with God. Where are you? Verse 10, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Humanity has been hiding themselves from God ever since. Until this day in John 1. When the rock of our salvation arrives and the very glory of God himself became our hiding place and refuge. In Jesus, we no longer need to hide from God. We've been invited to hide ourselves in him. This is the power of every, this is the gospel. Like, incidentally, this is what was being prefigured in the garden when God replaced those rotting fig leaves that were detached from the vine. They're withering away. They can't do any covering. He replaces them. They rep- those fig leaves represented humanity's vain efforts for salvation in and of themselves. But he replaces them with the skin of animals, which represents the blood sacrifice of Christ as it pointed to what Jesus would do on the cross as the Lamb of God. I told you, there's a lot going on here, right? So it's literally a picture of being clothed in, hidden in the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And so this encounter here in John 1 is in so many ways a redemption of what took place in the Garden of Eden. We're going to see this over and over again in the action, interactions between Jesus and other people. He is the God who turns. It's all over the Bible. <clears throat> again, Mark 6, 48. <clears throat> Remember this when Jesus is walking on water? Maybe you don't. A lot of people read over this. I'm going to read it for you just because you probably missed this. Mark 6, 48. And he saw, this is Jesus. Disciples are on a boat, they're in a storm, they're making headway painfully, right? He saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, we're talking like 3 a.m. here, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. That's a reference directly back to the glory of God that passes by. He intends to pass by, but, but... They cry out. And they echo. This, this echoes with the voices of the Israelites that are enslaved in Egypt crying out unto the Lord for their freedom to remember them. And just as God did for the Israelites in Egypt, he does for his disciples as Jesus turns. Matthew's version even records Jesus telling Peter to come to him on the water. Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you, James 4, 8. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, Psalm 37, 4. Because the true desire of our heart is Jesus himself. Over and over again in the scriptures, we're going to see this theme of Jesus walking on his way, passing by, and yet turning. Even when it seems like his priorities should be in one particular direction, like somebody's dying or something crazy is happening, and you think nothing could be more important than this, and then someone reaches out a hand and touches his garment, and he's like, time out! I'm turning. And I'm seeing her. 
He does it for everyone from the unclean woman who touches the hem of his garment to Zacchaeus, the traitor tax collector who climbs a tree just to see him. And Jesus turns aside and invites himself over to his house. Jesus turns. Often at the expense of what would seem to us more important endeavors, and yet he still turns towards those who draw near to him always. Always. Again, Jesus is the approachable hiding place and refuge through which we encounter the God who dwells in unapproachable light. Come to the Lord. So the first thing Jesus does is turn. He sees them and he gives them attention. But the second thing he does, the second thing he does is speak. And it comes in the form of a question. Like this is not unlike what happens in the Garden of Eden. Again, it, this is like God's mode of operations, right? His MO, modus operandi. Some of you learned something right there. It's clear that Jesus sees them, right? They're not hiding. They're approaching him, thanks to John the Baptist. That's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's approachable. But his question for them is no less penetrating. This is the second thing he does, is Jesus asks, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? What are you after? What are your motives? Not just where are you, what are you after? Right? What are you seeking? Remember, he sees them and he knows. He doesn't just see a label. He doesn't just see a political affiliation or the litany of confused paradigms through which they view the world which it would have been many, right? He's not looking at their doctrine or their failures or their triumphs. He sees them. He sees Andrew, and he sees John, son of Zebedee, and he sees them and he loves them, not because of anything they've done or have not done or could do or couldn't do, not because they might be ready for salvation or because they're John the Baptist's disciples, not because of any of that. He sees Andrew and he sees John. And this, again, this is the beloved disciple who's recording this account, Right? By the way, we know that this is John the, uh, the, the, not John the Bible, this is John the beloved disciple, the son of Zebedee, because he often intentionally leaves his name out of these encounters in a show of humility. And yet he does it so often that, it's so cl- that this is clearly him. Okay? So he sees these two men whom he knew before the foundations of the world and fearfully and wonderfully knit together in their mother's womb. So the Alpha and Omega himself speaks and he asks, what? Do you seek? Now, I'm not sure what I would have answered there, to tell you the truth. Right? Like, if I'm in their shoes, I'm sure they honestly probably had plenty to say. Remember, these two were disciples of John the Baptist. So maybe they were overwhelmed with what they wanted to say. There was so much there. Like, maybe, maybe they want to say, we seek the true king from the line of David. That, that's a good one. Like, maybe we seek the way, the truth, and the life. That's great. Like, we seek to overthrow the oppressive rule of the Romans. We seek the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament and all the promises of God. We seek the kingdom of God to come upon the earth. We seek salvation. Those are great answers. They would fit, and yet they all seem to fall short. Almost in like this overwhelmed state of paralysis of what to say, they respond to his question with a question. Honestly, on the surface, it seems kind of daring, right? Like they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? Like this was actually a formal commitment to him as their rabbi. They were signing up to be his disciples. They were going all in. They're saying, where you go, we go. Your people will be our people. Your God will be our God. Their question actually exposes their true desire to follow him and to lay aside all of their opinions and their agendas and to open their hands and say, we are yours. Where are you staying? We're in. Fully. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Because the true heart of every real disciple is to simply desire to be with Jesus it to follow the king of glory because where else is there to go his are the words of eternal life anything less is counterfeit christianity which prompts his third action here 
Jesus says, come and see and stay. Come and dwell with me. Come and tabernacle with me. Come to Jesus and your eyes will be open to the glory of God and the greatest purpose in eternity. Simply come and see and stay. Come to Jesus. See his glory for yourself. Let the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you dwell with him and he with you for eternity. This is what it means to share life in Christ. And this is how we are to share life in Christ. Us in him and he in us and his love flowing through us towards one another as a display of the invitation to the world around us of true and abundant life in Christ. But it means turning and seeing. Allowing yourself to be joyfully and sacrificially inconvenienced by the Great Commission. I'm going to say that again. It means turning and seeing and allowing yourself to be joyfully and sacrificially inconvenienced by his great commission. You're not too busy to turn and see those he's strategically placed around you. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all else will be added unto you. Like, Don't be too busy with your agendas to overlook his which is the great commission of making disciples who make disciples. Don't discount the people on the way. Have eyes to see them. Jesus sees them, and he's given you eyes if you'll use them. Let him inconvenience you. It's often where some of the most powerful and eternally significant interactions you will ever have will come from. But it means seeing others as he does, and it means asking questions to get to know them and identify where they're at with Jesus, right? Questions like, what's your spiritual background? What do you think about Jesus? Where are you with Jesus? How's your soul? What are you seeking? What are you after? What fuels you? What are your dreams? Those things always trace ultimately down to Jesus, whether people know it or not, always. Because everything else is a counterfeit. And so it means inviting, not just engaging. It's not just talking at people, but it's inquiring of people. It's inviting and introducing them. It's not just engaging, it's embracing and saying, come and see the Savior and stay, right? This is come meet Jesus in and through the body of Christ. Come to my community group. Come with me on Sunday. Let's grab coffee and read through the book of John together. Come and see and stay. Let's dwell with Jesus together. Let's tabernacle with him. Let's abide in him together. Come and see and stay. Real evangelism is simply helping other people realize that their greatest desire is actually to abide in Jesus. That he's the only, or that he is the one they've been waiting for and they've been looking for their whole lives. But evangelism isn't finished until discipleship begins. And that happens by introducing them to Jesus and embracing them into gospel community. Come and see and stay. And so as we're going to see next week, when you truly abide with Jesus, the next natural step is to share the life you've experienced in him with other people. Right? This is who we are as a church. This is what it means to share life in Christ. And this is how we share life in Christ with each other, our city, and beyond. So let's pray. (laughs) 